Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Eyes on Earth Roadshow, uh, to this online edition. My name is Martijn Seiger, and I will be your host this afternoon and tomorrow. In the coming two days, we will inform you about satellite data applications, and especially about the Copernicus system. In this session of this afternoon, we will learn about maritime spatial planning. During the session, you will have the opportunity to try the MSP software yourself. In other words, what does it take to be a maritime spatial planner? This learning and training session is organized in collaboration with the Breda University of Applied Science, BUAS, and one of the DS partners, Wikio. The BUAS contribution is hosted by Dr. Harald Barmelink and Professor Igor Meyer. Wikio is represented by Mrs. Marta Bertrand. Please submit your questions during the presentations in the text box on your screen. After the presentations, the speakers will try to answer as many questions as possible during the available time interval. Before we go into more detail of the session, I hand over the floor to Harald, who will address some practicalities for this session. I will join you again in the Q&A session with Wikio. Thanks a lot. Harald, it's up to you. All right, thank you very much, Martijn. And um, thank you to everyone who is joining us. And my name is Harald Warmelink. I, I indeed work for Breda University of Applied Sciences, and I am moderating this part of the session uh, together with uh, Igor Meyer, who I'll introduce in a minute. I'll just uh, take a moment to go over the schedule for the session this afternoon. Uh, so bear with me while I go to the next slide. There it is. So uh, some practicalities I'll discuss in a minute. Indeed, as Martijn mentioned, this schedule being one of the practicalities. Igor Meyer, my colleague, Professor Igor Meyer from Breda University of Applied Sciences will be giving a, a, a wonderful presentation entitled Planning for the Future with Games, the Maritime Spatial Planning Challenge Simulation Platform, which we'll be working with, uh, you'll be working with uh, today as well. After which I'll give a quick demo of how the software works. And Igor and I will then develop some plans and simultaneously viewers, you who are able and willing, can do this too. And I'll give some uh, uh, explanations on how that'll work in a minute. Uh, we'll also reflect a little bit on how, does the, how do the simulations respond to the spatial plans. All of this will become clear. Uh, feel free to keep asking questions in the text chat at any moment, of course. And then I'll hand over to Marta Bertrand for the Copernicus Marine Environment Monitoring Service. Uh, we thought it best to leave that to the end because we hope that from this session you'll be hungry for more data, uh, marine data in this sense and uh, in this case. So, and then Marta Verdon is the best person to tell you more about how to get that data and what to do uh, with it uh, as well. So uh, first about these practicalities. So I've mentioned um, already that, um, uh, and uh, you know from uh, the description just underneath this live stream, you will be able to join us um, um, using MSP Challenge. There's a link to download the MSP Challenge just below the live feed, as you, I'm sure you'll see. You'll have to uh, create an account and log in first to be able to download the software. And uh, should you run into problems doing that, uh, just let me know over the text chat. I'll be monitoring it during Igor's presentation. If you've managed to install it, great, let us know. Let me know also through the text chat, please, because then I'll, I can uh, yeah, I'll tell you what to do uh, next once we get there after the quick demo. Uh, again, feel free to ask at any time questions in the text chat. I'll be monitoring that. All right, then, I think uh, we're all set. Um, I think it's time to introduce Igor Meyer. I see he's uh, online, wonderful stuff. Uh, Igor Meyer, Professor Igor Meyer uh, of Serious Gaming at Breda University of Applied Sciences. Uh, he's a professor, uh, all of this uh, falls under. Uh, he's had uh, 20 years of experience uh, developing and uh, applying serious games, simulation games for all sorts of purposes uh, on the level of uh, policy development, um, organization, management, learning and change. And I'm sure uh, he'll uh, present himself further uh, as we get started with his presentation. So at this point, I'm going to switch off my webcam and I'll hand it over to Igor. Yeah. 
Igor, I think you need to switch on your microphone. Yeah, this always happens. Yeah. Apologies for that. Thank you. No Alex. problem. No One more problem. time for the introduction. Yeah, uh, also on my behalf, good afternoon, everyone. I hope you're having a good day from wherever you are. And as introduced already by Martijn and Harold, my name is uh, Igor Meyer. And uh, yes, my expertise lies in the area of serious games and simulations, especially for purposes such as urban planning and also maritime spatial planning. And in this presentation, I will tell you everything about that. Um, much ado about uh, this, let's just continue. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting Harold Warmelink and myself on behalf of the MSP Challenge Initiative for uh, this Ice on Earth Roadshow. And I must say, uh, we're happy to be here once again uh, because we have also presented at a first live show in Tallinn in November 2019. And we're fully aware that this meeting uh, takes place under a little bit of different circumstances, uh, digitally and virtually, uh, but we sincerely hope that we found a good alternative with this webinar. And uh, of course, let us know later how you experienced it. And for the moment, just ask your questions through the chat box. Okay, um, the objective of my about 30 minutes lecture during this webinar is to introduce and also critically reflect on what I call next generation planning support systems, or in its abbreviation, next gen PSS. And uh, in a nutshell, um, I believe that these are systems that are both evidence based because they are able to incorporate a large volume and variety of data from different sources. Among others, also Copernicus satellite data. Um, but at the same time, these planning support systems are highly socially interactive and also engaging uh, for all kinds of users because they are built with game technology and use the principles of game design and elements of play to make them very, very engaging for stakeholders, residents, planners, policymakers, and so on. I do think that this topic is um, very relevant in light of the discussion of how to make better use of satellite Copernicus data for planning and management of complex systems such as cities, river basins, forests, and in our case, also oceans. This is not only a technical data issue, um, but it also requires a much better understanding of how such data is or can be used in a complex political planning process. And this is what I want to explore a little bit further. And the second objective of this webinar is to illustrate and demonstrate exactly this point with the illustration or through the illustration of the Maritime Spatial Planning Challenge, because it is a data-driven game-based simulation platform for planning support in a very complex environment. So what we hope is this, that this webinar can trigger a, a, a discussion on the further integration of game technology and gameplay in data systems for planning support. Or otherwise, help us to think how we can incorporate Copernicus data or other satellite data into what we now have of the MSP Challenge Simulation Platform, because we are fully aware, aware that it can be developed further uh, and that it can be strengthened. Um, I'm a little bit afraid that my part is a bit more philosophical, but uh, for the more practical people in the audience, uh, rest assured that after about 30 minutes of uh, reflection, Harold Wellmerling will pick up again for a detailed explanation how the MSP challenge system actually works. And he will do this through a live demonstration, uh, which gives you all kinds of opportunities also to engage and to try out for yourself. This will follow later. 
So if you are ready for it, um, I'd like to start with um, my lecture. So let's start by looking at the ocean. And of course, we're all pretty much aware that oceans and seas play a vital role in our society. And many countries uh, around the globe rely on access to the sea for food and social economic development. And we also know that the diversity and intensity of human activities at sea, they are quite staggering. Just to give you a few examples, traditional sectors like shipping and fishing, but also dredging and recreation and mineral extraction. And so the extraction of oil and gas, oil rigs on the North Sea or any other sea, along with emerging economic sectors, such as for blue energy. This is offshore wind, tidal and wave energy. But also new emerging sectors such as agriculture, fish farming, and even deep sea mining. And all of these activities at sea, they have a rapidly growing demand for marine space. Now, these human activities at sea, they can easily get into each other's way. So many of them, for instance, need linear infrastructures, such as cables, pipelines, and shipping routes. And these, of course, are highly transboundary. They go from shore to shore and from infrastructure to infrastructure and crossing all kinds of EEZs in a sea basin. But also the ambitions of one country, for instance, for offshore wind energy, can easily become the problem of another sector, such as fishing in a nearby country. And especially also in the Netherlands, we've seen quite a bit of discussion also on Dutch fishermen worried in this case about the Brexit consequences. Uh, or for instance, the EU parliament which calls on for a ban of electric, electric pulse fishing. So traditional sectors like fishermen uh, are increasingly getting into kind of like a struggle for space with emerging new sectors such as agriculture, technological innovation, or especially also the building of wind farms. And these sectoral interests and ambitions we know they are voiced by all kinds of maritime stakeholders, fishermen and shippers, who form intricate webs of actor networks in countries around the sea base. And they all try to influence policies at all administrative levels, from the EU to the national to the local level. The spatial allocation of these maritime activities, what do we place where, therefore has to co be coordinated effectively among all the countries that share a sea basin. Now, we know that an important constraint to the ambitions of the maritime sectors and countries is the health status of marine ecosystems. Globally, marine and coastal ecosystems are under enormous pressure. Human uses are having a cumul cumulative effect on ecosystems that is not fully known. And for instance, this slide already shows not so much in Europe, but the emergence of dead zones uh, that are completely void of oxygen. So there are low hypoxic areas that almost become toxic where there is no marine life anymore. Uh, and uh, this is partly due to the pressures that as uh, human activities put also the emissions, also the runoffs uh, from land to sea as just an example of the pressures that we put on the marine environment. Now, of course, we are observing this and we're, we're aware of this, and there is a different and growing international treaties and agreements, such as the Convention on Biological Diversity, the CBD, but also the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, SDG 14, 14 which calls upon nations and stakeholders to conserve and sustainably use the oceans the seas and marine resources for sustainable development. And also at the European level, of course, we're becoming aware that we need to take care of the ocean much better. And several institutional frameworks have been put in place to implement this at the policy level. 
For instance, already very early in 2008, in 2008 European Union adopted the European Maritime Marine Strategy Framework Directive, the MSFD, which aims to achieve clean, healthy, and productive seas, which is called good environmental status. The integrated maritime policy aims to find a balance between blue growth, so prosperous, flourishing economic sectors, from wind farming to energy to shipping to fishing, on the one hand, and balance that with a good environmental status by using, among others, what it's called a method, which is called maritime spatial planning, or MSP. Now, MSP and what it is and how it's been implemented at the EU level has been done through an EU directive. In 2014, the EU Parliament and its member states, after quite some time of discussion and consultations, uh, agreed on the directive, the number 2014-89 EU, on mar marine spatial planning formal name, Framework for Maritime Spatial Planning 2040. Now, this directive lays down obligations for the EU member states to establish by the 31st of March 2021 a maritime spatial planning process and re resulting in maritime spatial plans with a minimum review period of 10 years. So basically it says to all the member states, start up a process consultation with a lot of stakeholders and set up the institutions that will lead to the implementation of a maritime spatial plan, which says the, marine, the main purpose of maritime spatial planning is to promote sustainable development and to identify the utilization of maritime space for different sea uses, as well as to manage the spatial uses and conflicts in marine areas. So what human activities are placed where and find a mechanism to solve the conflicts in between them. So at this moment, EU member states are in different implementation stage, stages of the MSP directive. Some countries, such as Denmark, are in the first planning cycle, while other countries, such as the Netherlands or Belgium, have already recently implemented the Maritime Spatial Plan or are already started a second or third iteration reviewing it. Now, this, all of this, because the countries are in different stages of development, makes transnational cooperation even more challenging as the countries need to reconcile differences in approaches, mandates, and capacity. The countries simply need to find a way to work together and to share the information and to align the different stages which they are in, in their MSP process. So in light of the above, the EU is therefore actively supporting transboundary coordination and stakeholder consultation in sea areas such as the Baltic or the Mediterranean, the Celtic seas or the North Sea regions, amongst others through all kinds of projects supported by EU European funding mechanisms. Now, let's have a little bit of a closer look to what the MSP directive says, because it is relevant on how we can support it with support systems, which is the main topic of our lecture. The EU directive on MSP gives five guiding principles for the MSP process. The planning should be integrated. So look at all the spatial uses and possible conflicts among them. And these, of course, need to be analyzed. What are these spatial uses and where are the conflicts? It should be evidence-based. So based on the best available knowledge, which also means data, of course. It should be ecosystem-based. So monitor the ecological status of the sea basin, look at the cumulative impacts of all the human activities on the ecology. It needs to be transboundary, sea basin oriented. So consult your neighboring countries and coordinate the allocation of space with the neighboring countries. And fifth, it should provide information to the general citizens 
but also consult all the relevant stakeholders, yes. energy sector, shipping sector, fishing industry. Now, looking at these five underlying principles, it is kind of easier said than done to abide by them. And this is because many of the principles are inherently dilemmatic. If you optimized for more evidence and more data, you might find that it becomes a little bit more difficult, for instance, to inform the general public and to consult general stakeholders and so on. So more of one principle often leads to less of the other principles. And whereas actually all the five principles are equally important and we need to find a way to balance them. Let's take a little bit of a closer look to this. Evidence-based planning builds upon a large volume and variety of data and all kinds of other forms of information about geophysical and bio-natural systems and maritime sectors such as shipping, fishing, and renewable energy. However, such data and knowledge is compartmentalized in sectors and disciplines. Getting access to proper data is only the first challenge it's already a big challenge because a lot of this data is also proprietary data. But once you have it, integrating a large volume and variety of data from different sectors that come in different formats is another challenge. How do we make these data from different categories and with different formats and different, how do we make it talk to each other? Now, you might think this can be solved, right? So several initiatives have been taken to harmonize data, as well as to facilitate the data and information ex exchange at a national or sea basin level, such as through initiatives as AMODNET or HELCOM. However, the centralized availability of a large volume and variety of harmonized data does not automatically lead to a better understanding of maritime spatial planning. We simply do not know very well how maritime activities deployed by different economic sectors interact with each other or with the marine environment over a longer period of time. So only having the data is not enough. We need to turn this data into explorative systems where we could see where if all of the activities start to be planned, how do they interact? And how does this lead to long-term effects? Just to illustrate, Wind farms can lead to a rerouting of shipping lanes, but this may cause an increase of fuel consumption. And this might cause an increase in CO2 and other emissions and relocates the pressures, such as noise, to other areas which affect the marine environment. So in a nutshell, we would need to be able to simulate the complexity of it. In reality, Numerous other factors also from other sectors come into play and they all interact in a complex non-linear manner with self-reinforcing and self-mitigating feedback loops and significant time delays between cause and an effect. Well, it goes a little bit too far, but if we would go and dig this out a little bit, we would go into the theory of complex systems. So we live in an age of complexities where actually Everything we do at sea creates emergent effects, so yes, emergent effect is where one and one is bigger than two. And these are attributes of complex system. Oceans and seas are probably the best example of a complex system. Furthermore, planet stakeholder interactions themselves are a form of complex social political system behavior. Sectoral and transboundary consultations often lead to political compromises that are rational from an individual actor perspective, but much less rational from an integrated system perspective. Now, in sum, coming back to these principles, the combined principles of the directive would require planners and stakeholders to develop a proper understanding of the complexity of MSP, particularly the cross-sectoral interactions over a longer period of time and the cumulative effect on the marine environment. However, planners and stakeholders are often specialists driven by their own interests and beliefs. They are not always trained in the use and interpretation of data 
in intelligent data-driven support systems or in dealing with the uncertainties of and limitations in scientific knowledge. So the underlying challenge is actually how can we balance non-expert stakeholders to interact better with smart data systems? And therefore, innovative planning support systems are needed. Planning is often seen as a technical practice, a matter of assigning space to different economic and ecological functions by optimizing costs, benefits, and constraints. However, planning is also social learning, a process in which politicians, planners, experts, and stakeholders exchange knowledge, values, and ideas where they can overcome to a shared and higher level of understanding about the object of planning, such as wind farm shipping and fishing at the North Sea, and as well, each other. High quality social interaction is a prerequisite for social learning. Therefore, planning and social learning heavily relies on methods and approaches that it can bring stakeholders to the table and can facilitate their interaction. It also relies on methods that can bring best available data and knowledge to the stakeholder table and their discussions. This is the main dilemma of data-driven, evidence-based and stakeholder-oriented transplanetary planning. And I think this picture shows a little bit that illustration. How do we bring the evidence and the data and the data-driven information systems to the stakeholder table? But also on the other hand, how do we let the stakeholders themselves interact with these systems. So these systems either need to become more interactive or we need to find a way to bring the intelligence from these systems to the stakeholder table. And that is exactly the core of what the Maritime Spatial Planning Directive said. However, engaging and committing stakeholders to a planning process itself can be a real challenge. Planning methods should therefore also be able to motivate stakeholders. This can be done by making it engaging, as well as safe, transparent, efficient, and fair. Well, in the last few years, several planning support systems, PSS, for ecosystem-based MSP have been developed, each one having specific strengths and limitations, for instance, with regard to data richness, flexibility, ease of use, and interactivity. But few of these tools can be qualified as integrated in the sense that they link a great amount of variety of data with simulations models for a wider range of maritime sectors, such as energy, offshore wind production, and so on. And further, most PSS tend to be very specialized, scientific, making them useful for desk analysis, but less effective in an interactive context, so as for stakeholder engagement, transboundary consultation, scenario development, or co-design process. And this is where gaming comes in. In the seminal book, Gaming the Future's Language is already a classic from 1974, but it's been picked up by many, many people, uh, developing these ideas much further into discussions on serious games, simulation games, or now even also things like digital twins. Duke argues that a simulation game or a serious game is an excellent communication and learning tool for planning and decision makers exactly because it's able to, to link and to balance this uncertainty in the simulated world with the political, social complexity of all of these stakeholders around the table. Games are good at simulating complexity on the basis of a large volume and variety of data. This is what we know from entertainment games like SimCity. They can engage and scaffold the user players in learning from the game system and other players. And through playing a game, Planners and stakeholders experientially understand the dynamic interrelations among various subsystems, the interdependencies among the actors, and the consequences of actions well into the future. So this is the background and the philosophy of the MSP Challenge Simulation Platform. So the second core part of the lecture. And of course, the objective as introduced is to illustrate and to demonstrate the MSP challenge simulation platform against this background. So let me give a very, very short introduction on the MSP challenge simulation platform um, as a practical case for these ideas of bringing data simulation platforms and stakeholders together 
and linking them through game thinking and game technology. Well, the MSP Challenge Simulation Platform was developed to support planning at social learning by trying to overcome some of the dilemmas in the EU directive with game thinking and game technology. And on the slide, you see already a little bit of an illustration on how we stepped it up since 2011 to what we have now. The idea to develop a simulation game about MSP emerged already in 2011 from a collaboration between staff from the Ministry of Infrastructure and Water Management in the Netherlands and game designers initially based at Delft University of Technology and now at Breda University of Applied Science. Our aim was to find innovative ways of engaging stakeholders and planners in a new era of MSP. The MSP challenge sought to combine role play, game technology, geodata, and simulation models to create planning oriented learning tools for MSP professionals. A communicative environment that makes players think, talk, and interact. Now, at, the at the, this time of uh, the presentation, the original simulation game has evolved into a computer based simulation platform and several board-based formats that are often or sometimes used in combination. Here in the middle in 2016 on the slide, you see an impression, the board game, which is not a topic for today, we will leave it at rest. But if you want to know more, just Google and go to the website on the MSP challenge or read some of the articles where you find a full description on how we use the board game. And it's often used as an introduction to the full-blown simulation platform. But the main topic for today is the MSP Challenge Simulation Platform as it is now. The MSP Challenge Simulation Platform has been designed to help decision makers, stakeholders and students also to understand and manage the maritime blue economy and the marine environment. The MSP Challenge Simulation Platform integrates geodata, both marine and human activities sourced from a, a, a great many open data portals, notably HELCOM, AMOTNET, and also Copernicus data and national data center. It subsequently connects these data to science-based simulation models for shipping, energy, and ecology. But the platform is so flexible that in principle, you can create APIs or linkages with other simulation models. And we're already exploring that we think of climate change models or water quality models. So we're constantly developing these simulators further. A game engine built in Unity, uh, for those with a background in, in engineering or game engineering, uh, forms the foundation of the front end user application. And it brings all of the aforementioned elements of so the data, the simulators, and the user interaction together. This simulation platform allows anyone, experts as well as, well as non-experts, to creatively operate it for scenario development and for multiplayer game sessions. So what makes the system unique, and you can uh, practice that or experience that later, is that all the countries around a sea basin at the same time can draw plans in the same simulation platform and they run over time. So it is a multiplayer uh, game environment. And this is very, very useful for multiple purposes, purposes such as scenario exploration, co-design, so drawing and making plans together, but also the validation of plans that have already been made or policy oriented learning. So what is marine spatial planning and where does it lead? Although the simulation platform has taken a significant step towards becoming a next generation marine planning support system, it continues to use play mechanics in the form of player roles, scenario and challenges. And we also develop the user interaction in a very playful uh, mode. So using what we know from game design techniques. The simulation platform furthermore links to a knowledge repository containing a lot of static information, for instance, on wind turbines or marine species where you can click on and then you can consult them. 
And, uh, but this is still a proof of concept, it links to a virtual reality module so that the player planner can actually click for more information in the game and have a virtual representation of the consequences of what they just designed in the moon spatial planning. This is all to be developed much further, but we can imagine that in the future, after you design the highly innovative wind farm, floating wind farm, uh, that you can then uh, go into AR or in VR and actually see what you have designed and maybe also have stakeholder interaction in that environment to talk with stakeholders on the consequences. Or even see the wind farm that you have designed, to see it from a di different perspective because you can transpose your or fly to shore and then see how it will look uh, from a shore perspective. What is very important is, is that in 2015, simulation platform became part of three large EU funded projects, North Sea, uh, Baltic Lines and Simkelt. And I won't go into details into these projects, but they allowed us to develop different sea basins. So the same simulation platform actually hosts different sea basins. And it is also possible to uh, take uh, the platform as kind of like a middleware and if you would like to develop an, a version, an addition for the Adriatic or the Mediterranean or the Black Sea, this is all possible. And we're discussing with all kinds of interested parties and exactly doing this. But for the moment, the simulation platform hosts a bespoke edition created for the Clyde Marine region near Scotland, working closely together with uh, the government and stakeholders in Scotland, in the area, the complete Baltic and North Sea basins. And we hope to soon start an Adriatic edition and then explore through the Mediterranean. We are furthermore exploring the whole MSP challenge concept as a digital twin for the Netherlands part of the North Sea. So we also see this way of thinking as a stepping stone for another uh, topical issue, which is what is the role of digital twins for planning? Because in a, in a way, this is a digital twin. And one of the key topics is, of course, how to connect this to live data or how to bring in uh, satellite data into the databases so that we can have uh, a, a better use of this data, which is the topic also for discussion later. Now, have the simulation platforms been used? I could give another lecture, but I will soon stop this lecture because I see that I already running a little bit over time. Uh, but just for those who are, are curious on how does it work in practice? Yes, the additions of the simulation platform have been used by hundreds of stakeholder planners and student, students. There is different footages uh, also on the website that can give you impressions and there is a a whole bunch of pictures on uh, on the internet of different sessions where you can get an impression. This is more like uh, an, an intimate session with uh, friends, but this is showing a multi-stakeholder session where multiple users play different countries and they all draw their plans in the same environment, being moderated by some technical experts. Uh, and we have used uh, the MSP challenge for many, many stakeholder sessions or in the different areas. So based on our experiences, these are a few, a little bit, uh, the, the numbers can be updated a bit more, uh, but just to give you an indication on where and how much they have been used. Based on our experience with using the game in different formats with different, with many different audience and participant feedback from these events, it is apparent that the MSP challenge learning by doing or learning by playing approach is both enjoyable informative and effective for many. Although some find the gaming approach to public policy issues and simulate an environment rather challenging, they have to get used to the idea that it's built with game technology and that it runs in a gameful mode. But there is no doubt that it has stimulated widespread interest and has received overwhelmingly positive reviews. Participants and observers appreciate the gaming format, which creates a safe place to develop a better understanding of MSP. Now, we are fully aware that there are plenty of critical questions to be asked and answered. Who is invited to play these games and who is not? By whom and for the what reasons? What happens if the wrong messages about the MSP is passed on through these games? 
What if MSP authorities or participant players cue the points the simulation games are trying to make? What if the players take the simulation game too literally and cannot distinguish fact from fiction? What if the simulation games are not real enough and are only perceived as an enjoyable exercise after which everyone continues to think and do as act before? And there is a whole bunch of technical and development issues that we still have and where we can work with many communi uh, communities to make it much better. These questions are relevant to those who want to use the MSP challenge approach in the future. They illustrate the need to have a well thought through idea of the learning objectives of target audiences from the beginning. And importantly, not to mistake the MSP challenge or things like digital twins as a method for implementing MSP, but just as a very welcome support of the learning processes in discovering and understanding the benefits and potential of data-driven game-based planning support systems. I thank you for listening and I give the floor back to Harold or maybe the demonstration, the, the trailer. Harold? Back yeah, to wonderful. Yeah, thank you, Igor. Uh, it might be nice, Igor, to point out uh, this article if you want. Yes. Um, you can go uh, to ResearchGate. I think we have published more than 10 articles on the MSP challenge. Uh, if you Google MSP challenge, uh, on, uh, yeah, then, and, and then maybe on ResearchGate, then nearly all of the publications are open access and you can download it. This one in particularly describes a little bit more how it came to be. Uh, but there are other publications that go more on the technology side of it and uh, you can explore further from here. Yeah, wonderful. Yeah, let's let's show the trailer, shall we, Igor? Yeah, yes, please. Why not? We have it and it's nice. So I'll just start that up. Uh, give me a second. I just need to change the setting here. And uh, here we go, everyone. Here's the trailer for the MSP Challenge Simulation Platform. The MSP Challenge Simulation Platform, the next generation of maritime spatial planning support. Human activities at sea easily get into each other's way and have a long-term impact to the marine ecology. Therefore, countries around a sea basin have to coordinate and balance interests or face the consequences. The MSP Challenge Simulation Platform helps planners and stakeholders understand and manage the complexity of maritime spatial planning. In the interactive simulation, country planners view the entire sea region and review many different data layers to make an assessment of the current status. They develop plans for future use of sea space over a period of several decades. The consequences of decisions for energy, shipping and the marine environment are simulated and visualized in indicators and heat maps. The MSP Challenge simulation platform uses the best available data provided by many authorities in Europe, and it has a unique link with the ecological modeling software Ecopath with Ecosim. Digital game technology makes it fun and easy to draw and modify plans, run the simulations, and interact with others. It even has a 3D virtual reality model. This makes it a perfect environment for education, stakeholder engagement, and interactive planning. With additions for the North Sea, the Baltic, and the Clyde Marine region, the platform is ready to host any sea basin in the world. The MSP Challenge simulation platform, coming soon to a sea near you. All right, there you have it. More information can be found on the website, and you're also you'll also be able to find uh, this uh, trailer itself on the website as well. So I'm just going to switch back to the normal mode of presenting. There you go. That's all done, and I'll just uh, get out of this uh, slide there. Thank you very much, uh, Igor, for your presentation. I think it was very uh, insightful. Uh, to also get the background of why would you develop such a thing as the MSB Challenge Simulation Platform to begin with. We have a couple of questions. Uh, before I get into them, uh, I'll just uh, uh, respond to some of the more technical questions uh, or some issues that might be uh, in asking questions to begin with. I noticed uh, the start of a question by Dietli Rash. 
uh, a postdoctoral researcher, uh, biodiversity loss and pollution due to reclaimed coastal aquaculture on the Chinese coast. Uh, but I noticed that the actual question was cut off. I can't read it. It starts with what could be a... Uh, so I'm desperately trying to uh, read the re actual question, but perhaps Dietrich could uh, just copy in the question again, and then we'll be able to cover it. And I also noticed a question or a point by uh, Martijn, uh, Martijn Haag, so not uh, Martijn Seiger, our Martijn, so to speak, but uh, Martijn Haag, who is uh, trying to uh, download uh, software. Uh, other people sometimes also have uh, one or two issues. Um, uh, I think uh, what you need to do is uh, try to um, uh, first register with your email address. You'll get a verification email, but sometimes it ends up in the spam folder. So please do check your spam folders for the verification email. Uh, if you've gone through all that, then just return to the MSP Challenge uh, community website, community wiki. So that's community.mspchallenge.info and then log in from there with your newly, newly created username and password, and then you should be able to download the software. Okay, uh, let's see. I think I need to reshare my screen. I might be right. Okay, yeah, I just need to reshare my screen. So I'll just do that, give me a second. And um, I'll just go through over some of these questions. Uh, with Igor. Are you there, Igor? Yes, I'm here. Oh, okay, I'm wonderful. The question. So yes. you need to inform me what the questions are. Yes, I will I will tell you the answer uh, ask the questions on behalf of the viewers. So Santanu asked the question, uh, well said, interesting subject. By which time frame will the full version be available for download? Igor. Harold, yeah, yeah. you can better answer that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, probably. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, we are we are working really hard to uh, finalize the software. Uh, it's uh, it's proven a bit tougher than expected. We had hoped to release it the full platform sooner, uh, but we are really working hard to get it released uh, around the summer. So very soon, uh, actually, since it's already <laughs> summer. So uh, yeah, expect to uh, we expect to release it uh, within a couple of months' time, hopefully as uh, soon as possible. And uh, soon after we release the software, we will actually go. Um, we will actually go live with the uh, actual source code. Okay, uh, let's see yeah, this, what else. This is maybe I don't know if anybody asked, and it was somewhere on the slide. Uh, just to be clear, the MSP Challenge is an uh, open source, community-based, not-for-profit initiative. So it's not a commercial enterprise. Uh, our mission is really to make all the knowledge and all the software and everything developed open source and free for all. Perhaps you could get into that very briefly, uh, Igor. Why Why do we actually release it open source? Uh, for, um, uh, for more visionary reasons, because we think it is important uh, if, if it is about managing the ocean and the seas that it is a public value it is in the public interest um, and that also the community approach uh, because it, it is for instance also multiplayer it needs to be trustworthy uh, people need to believe that the process is fair but also that the data where it comes from uh, how the simulation run uh, that it can be scrutinized evaluated checked by anyone um, and also that if people think like, okay, this model, if I connect it to it, it predicts this and this and this, but what happens if I change parameters or create or link it to an alternative ecological model, what happens? So there is all kinds of practical, strategic, uh, but also visionary uh, reasons on making it community-based open source. One of it is also, it's been funded uh, by EU uh, funding schemes. Uh, and this also gives it more importance that we uh, deliver it, everything to the public. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, then we have a question here from Kalinski. 
can the software be used for non-EU seas at present, or do we need to wait for the sea ocean specific modules to be developed? And uh, Kalinsky is interested in the West Indian Ocean. Uh, yes, the platform ho can host any sea basin in the world. It doesn't mean that uh, it is already having these additions. So what is necessary is to have a team to develop that addition. So data needs to be collected and put into a data service so that the platform can read it. Uh, and uh, as far as simulation models, for instance, for ecology do not exist, they need to be developed. But of course, once you have that, uh, it is yours and you can use it freely uh, into the future, improve it, build on that. So it does require a little bit of an investment in developing the addition, but you don't have to go to the back end. All the back end uh, functions uh, are provided and taken care of by the platform itself. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, I think we have time for one more question and then we really need to move on. This is a question by uh, Zoran Mayor. I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Apologies if I'm not. Uh, did you ever test the practical application of the system in river basin management, especially concerning the impacts of various developments on ecological and other levels? So did you have, did we ever test the application of the system more on rivers, river basin management? So the estuaries perhaps? The short answer, no, we did not. Uh, this platform is specifically designed for uh, marine spatial planning. So ocean seas is, uh, you could argue maybe that we could go to coastal zone management, integrated coastal zone management, but a specific characteristic of this platform is the trend boundary uh, aspect, so the scale of it. Uh, sea basins tend to be large, uh, with multiple countries shoring around that sea basin. Uh, and this is uh, a specific characteristic of marine spatial planning. I do know, of course, that discussions on developing interactive planning support systems similar as this one, uh, for land-based planning or for river basin uh, management or, and so on. Uh, they have their own stream of development. Uh, and it might be that other environments that have similar characteristics are a more useful platform uh, for these purposes. So city planning, uh, river basin management uh, and so on, and the MSP challenge platform, of course, Anything is possible, eh? given time, resources, money, you could develop this into a platform that can also simulate the river basin management. But at this point, it's not in the core focus of what we have developed. Yeah. Yeah, perhaps uh, we, we should, we could uh, uh, mention here the Clyde edition, which is such a, a smaller edition that it sort of covers the estuary of the Clyde River in uh, Northwest Scotland, but of course that's still not uh, river basin management. But uh, yeah, okay. Uh, okay, I think uh, I'm gonna move on to a demo. Thank you very much for asking a question so far. Uh, people like Zoran, Kalinski, everyone, Andrea. Um, thank you very much. Uh, keep, keep questions coming. Feel free to keep asking questions through the chat. Uh, especially during this part, uh, where I'll be uh, giving a brief demo of MSP Challenge. Is that okay, Igor? You ready? Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, okay. I'll just bring up the software on the main screen here. So here is the startup uh, screen you get when you run MSP Challenge. And I'd like to point out at this point that I can see that uh, Pranav and Andrea managed to install and uh, run the software. So that's great. Thank you very much, Pranav and Andrea. I hope uh, you'll be able to follow along with me and uh, try some things out while Igor and I uh, get, to, uh, get to do some maritime spatial planning, basically. Yeah? So you have just become a maritime spatial planner thanks to this software, as we like to say during a session. So please just follow along as I do, uh, start up the software. Again, if anyone at any point feels like uh, trying uh, to join in, uh, just follow the instructions underneath this feed. 
and you should be able to download and install uh, and run the client, and you can do the same as I do. So this is when you start the software, you'll get to the server login screen. We are going to the demo tab, and we're going to connect to the North Sea demo. As you can see, we also have a Baltic Sea demo, just in case you're interested in that. This is all free to use, obviously. Now, um, you'll have the option to uh, select team color. Uh, here, we've created uh, color-based uh, uh, teams, which represent different countries around the North Sea. I'd like to uh, point out that, uh, I, I, well, I'd like to ask Pranav if he could um, uh, log in with green and Andrea, if you could log in as purple. So Pranav with green and Andrea with purple, that'll ease things along. We will go as orange. So now it's connecting. This uh, always takes a moment. What's happening right now is, is uh, the, the, the software is downloading all the data from the server that you're connecting to. And uh, the nice thing about this is that, um, yeah, everyone is logging on to the same server, right? This is what Igor was explaining in his presentation. This is a multiplayer uh, game software uh, or game-based software, we could say, simulation platform. So that means we're all logging on now to the same online server. Now, of course, this is always a little bit tricky if everything is uh, going according to plan. Uh, uh, always tricky when you're doing something live, but well, let's see how it uh, goes. Uh, as Igor mentioned, we are still uh, fully developing the software. And as I already mentioned as well, this is taking a, a, lot of, a bit more time than we had hoped, but uh, we are planning to release everything very soon. So, I'll give it a couple more seconds, or we'll switch to uh, alternative. So this is the North Sea online demo that we're downloading right now. Of course, uh, how fast this also goes, by the way, also depends on uh, your internet connection. The online demo server is located here in Europe. Uh, which means if you are logging on to this from Australia or India or South America, especially far away places, it might take a bit longer. But well, here we are in the North Sea. Uh, let's see. Okay, yeah, this is a nice setup. So what do we see here? I'll just quickly go over the main features. What I want to do is tell you a little bit about how you can actually review lots of data and how you can actually draw up plans, spatial plans. Now, all the data layers are over here in the top left of your screen under these buttons. So you can just click on any of these buttons uh, actually activate it, like the EEZ or Exclusive Economic Zone. There you go. You can activate and deactivate as such. By the way, if you want to go over the map, just right click and hold and drag your mouse. So right click, hold the mouse button and drag. And if you want to zoom in and out, use your scroll wheel on your mouse, like so. You can actually zoom in quite far. OK, so we've got lots of data. Fair enough, right? Uh, I won't go through all of these buttons. You're free to explore as you wish. Things like wind speed is actually based on Copernicus uh, Earth observation data. So, of course, this is not literally the, uh, uh, the high quality, high resolution photographs that uh, the Copernicus satellites uh, uh, make of the Earth. This is, of course, an abstraction and a, a further analysis, a further rehashing of the data to create a map like this. Now, you might be wondering, what do these colors mean? You have a legend over here on their active layers. Just make this a little bit cleaner. I'll just increase the resolution a little bit. Or actually, I'll just make the interface slightly smaller. Resume. So here we have the active layers, the layers that are currently active, including wind speed, which I can expand like so with this collapse, collapse expand arrow. So we have a nice legend here. So obviously, this is a heat map, as we like to call it. The darker, the higher the wind speed in this case. Now you can, I can also deactivate and activate layers over here as, as soon as I've first selected them. I'll also have a, I'll show you quickly some of these human activities that take place at sea, such as the development of wind farms. So these are wind farms that according to our data, which is not super up to date, but 
reasonably up to date. These are wind farms that are currently either being operated already or are still in development. But we also have quite a lot of areas of search, as they're often called, uh, meaning these are areas that are really uh, yeah, up for wind farm developments uh, in the future. And as you can see, there are lots of them. The North Sea is a very popular place for wind farm developments. Not everywhere, but you can imagine why certain countries have more problems to uh, develop wind farms offshore. Countries like Norway, for instance, because what you're seeing at the, in the background as a layer is bathymetry. You see the difference? This bathymetry layer shows you actually that how deep the water is off the coast of Norway. And of course, very deep waters makes it impossible to develop wind farms, as you can imagine, I think. By the way, at any point, you can just click on the map like so, and then a property window will pop up. In this case, concerning that bathymetry. And you'll be able to see here that actually, yes, this is very deep, 250 meters or more. This is indeed a very deep area. As opposed to, for instance, uh, the area over here in the middle, this area, which is called the Dogger Bank. It's a sand bank. If I click here, you'll see that it's actually very shallow, very shallow, zero to 20 meters deep. Perfect for wind farm development. If, yeah, if even though it's quite far from shore, huh? I can actually show you how far it is. Uh, bottom right corner here, I have a ruler, which I can click. And then if I click and drag, hold and drag, I see it's roughly 120 kilometers from the shore of the UK, of England. So we've got lots of uh, data layers more. Uh, one thing to note here as well is the oil and gas installations. Boom, look at all those oil and gas installations right there. Just in case people were wondering why this is uh, why these countries around the North Sea are quite wealthy? Well, this is one of the reasons. Also up here, Scotland, Norway. This is a very big, important place for Norway. Lots of oil and gas installations over here in the North Sea. Of course, competing for space, right? That's the whole uh, issue. Now, some of these data layers are also just not static data layers showing you where things are, but are actually simulated data layers. Uh, for instance, the different pressures, those are simulated. So it's not real data, it's not real life data, it's simulated data. So based on all these human activities, like for instance, those oil and gas installations, quite a lot of noise is being generated and we simulate that. And that noise is then fed into a simulator running in the background on the ecosystem, uh, meaning the ecosystem actually takes noise and all these other environmental pressures into account and calculates which species are, yeah, uh, to put it mildly, bothered by that and uh, changes those heat maps for the species accordingly. So for instance, if I were to deactivate the oil and gas installations and have a look at these fish layers. These are again simulated data layers. We can see a, a distribution, a dispersal of cod. Again, here's the legend. So high density is a darker and a greener is sort of medium density. Blue is very low density. And we can also have a look at, for instance, herring, quite an important species. And you might notice all these blue spots. Well, I think you can imagine uh, why those are there. Uh, that might be because of things that are in the way of this species that they don't really like. Uh, it sort of correlates nicely there with oil and gas installations. Yeah, and probably the pressures that they introduce. So you're getting the general idea. We've got lots of data layers over here. You can click through them. And if you need to know what the uh, different colors mean, there's legends over here. And you can actually also deactivate certain some of these uh, subtypes for each layer sometimes. So this is a general introduction of uh, the software uh, in terms of data layers. But of course, what we really want to do is draw up some plans. So up here in the top left corner, you have a big plus to create a new plan. This brings up a plan wizard. The plan wizard uh, basically is the first step towards drawing up a spatial plan. 
What you need to do is you need to provide a plant name. So let's say we want to draw up a wind farm. You enter wind farm. Uh, I'm just checking if everyone uh, can uh, see this and follow this along. Is this big enough? Igor, how is it on your screen? It's okay. You can't yeah? the ice on earth wind farm. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. Okay. So uh, first step is to provide a name. Second step is to actually select what layers you want to include include in this plan. Now you could select all of them if you want to make it really hard for yourself to plan uh, uh, a certain area with all these activities. But of course, in this case, I called it wind farm because we want to plan a wind farm. So I'm just selecting wind farm there. And on the right, uh, the selection is shown. So you also notice there's energy cables uh, selected there as well. Uh, automatically, uh, because what is a wind farm without a cable? It's nothing. You need to be able to get the electricity on your grid on land. So uh, I also add actually the landing stations. Landing stations, just in case uh, you don't know, these are the points uh, often called landfall points. These are the points where the electricity cable of, from the wind farm offshore actually connects to the onshore grid, the onshore electricity grid. So these are the landing stations. Um, adding those now, and just in case, I I sort of can imagine already that the wind farm I'm going to draw uh, is going to get in the way of some other thing going on already, wherever I am. So I'm just going to say, well, you know what? Let's activate the IMO routes as well. Um, just for the people who don't know, IMO stands for the International Maritime Organization, and these are basically shipping routes. So routes defined by the IMO as safe for shipping. Now, you might notice uh, as a third step over here, yeah, we have to set a realization date. Now, this is really a simulation, right? So this means we are actually playing in a certain point of time. In this case, at the top here, still underneath this window, uh, plan wizard window, you see May 2027, and you actually see a clock counting down one hour, 38 minutes, and some seconds to go. This is a, con the online demo is a continually uh, running simulation. So month by month, time progresses, and we are already in a simulated time of June 2027. And I have to take that into account for my new spatial plan. So when do I want this to be finished? Uh, realizing that with these data layers, yeah, there'll be some 10 months construction time. So yeah, the actual construction will initiate in July 2027, once I want everything there by May 2028. So I'll just put this a little higher, to give me some more time to finalize this plan. Because yeah, if it, if it turns into July 2028 and my plan is not finished yet, yeah, I'll be too late. So I've changed the date there to May 2029. So now I can go ahead and click on accept. So here we then see a plans monitor popping up, which is under this button as well. You can activate and deactivate it, the plans monitor. You can also make it bigger. Just click and drag to make this a bit bigger. And here we see my wind farm plan under design. So I'll just get rid of this for now. And it's nice to see that probably Andrea is also uh, managing to build a wind farm or at least start building a wind farm uh, in uh, purple, which is Norway. So Andrea, wonderful. Keep up the good work. Um, for now, we'll continue uh, with this demo. You can click on Start Editing Plan. And once you do so, you'll be able to see uh, some more drawing options. Ah, I also see someone logged in as Blue developing a wind farm and Blue being Denmark. Wonderful. Thank you. Nice to see people joining in. We'll get to your plans uh, later, so it'll be interesting to see what you uh, were able to uh, draw up. So, yeah, since we're orange, and orange is this uh, area, which happens to be the Netherlands, the Dutch exclusive economic zone, a big area, as you can see. I mean, the country is uh, smaller than the actual EEZ, almost, I think. So let's, uh, yeah, let's, uh, let's think what we should do. And Igor, at this point, I'd like your input. What do you think? What should we do? Develop a wind farm uh, just in the Dutch area or somewhere okay, else? Or go for the Docker Bank. If you yeah. Can yeah, the Docker Bank, it's realistic. Yeah. There are all kinds of plans to develop energy islands and wind farming and the Docker plan. And that is a very interesting area also in terms of ecology. Yeah. 
So we might see some effects there if you develop a large wind farm in the Gogo Bank area. It's also yeah. transboundary, if you would like. Yeah, yeah, true. I will. Yeah, that's a good, nice idea. Uh, feel free to, for all the people who are joining in, well, all the people for the people who are joining in, feel free to uh, draw whatever you want. I'll just quickly show how you do it. You're in your plan, you're in editing mode, so you can just click on create. And here you can select the layers you want to create uh, an, a shape with. So you do need to select wind farms over here, if it's not, and then click create to start drawing up an actual wind farm. Otherwise, you'll be drawing an energy cable, for instance, if that's selected. But I'm selecting wind farm. So yeah, like Igor suggested, let's create um, a nice uh, transboundary wind farm area. I'm going to assume uh, also from this data layer, which I activated, which is the wind farm area of search, sort of grayed out a little for the background. Uh, I'm going to assume that England, country red, I should say, is on board. And I'm going to draw up a wind farm over this area. Let's see how far we get. Huh? So what you can do, click create and just click once to place a first point. Uh, and then just let go and then click once again to create a second point, and a third point, and a fourth point if you want. And then as you can see by itself, a shape will start to develop. And you feel free to click once again, don't hold, just click once to start making this shape, whatever shape you want. And once you're happy, uh, I think I'll just try to stretch it, stretch it. Once you're happy, you can either double click or just go to the first point and then click. And then you finished your shape. Uh, so there you go. Uh, we've created a huge wind farm. How huge? Well, if I zoom in a bit more, you'll see an estimation of how much energy this might create. 57, almost 58 gigawatts, which is indeed huge. Uh, it's not very realistic, but that's fine. This is just a demo. Yeah, we'll need lots of cables, Igor. Oh dear. Too big? Where to go? Yeah, where to go? Oh yeah, if 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 we're gonna do this uh, properly, uh, yeah, we should share some of this energy with England at least, right? Yeah. Yeah. Make I could to the English shore. Yeah. So uh, what if we do? Station? What if we do cables to the Netherlands and to the, the English shore? Yeah. yeah. Just landed in Den Helder and landed uh, yeah. in the English shore. Okay. Find Den Helder, spot. yeah, we are Dutchies, so we know uh, our country, of course. Den Helder is over here, up here. Now, I noticed there's no landing station there, so that's fine. I'll just create one, make it part of the plan. Landing station, create, and click. This is just one point. It's sort of the icon is a little uh, socket there, so that's great. Um, okay, I've just created a landing station. It's one one gigawatt, so it's not at all enough. But I can still change that. I can say I can say edit, click on it again, and just turn it into ten gigawatt. Not enough, still, but better than one gigawatt. Okay, landing station over there. What about uh, in England? Should we use an existing one? Yeah, why not? Yeah, maybe this one. It seems to be closest. Yeah, people tend to think about how much how much cable do I need to draw up. So let's say uh, let's make some energy. Well, at least one cable. I'll just click on energy cables over there. I'll click the highest type, 460 megawatts. I'll click on create, and now from the heart of your wind farm, represented by this green lightning bolt, you can click once and then start to draw a line. In this case, which represents the cable. Again, you can. Place as many points as you want. It doesn't have to be one straight line. You can say, oh, I want this cable to exit the wind farm over here. Well, yeah, oh, why not over there? And then continue in a straight line to this uh, landing station. So there you go, one cable done. Then I'll click from the heart here, and I'll try to go in a straight line to Den Helder. My god, this is quite an impactful wind farm in terms of uh, spatial planning has a big impact. Big cable being drawn up there. You can actually see how long it is if we were to finish this. Uh, so, okay, we're done for now. I'll click accept. Also in the interest of time, we only have 10 minutes left. Now, what I want to point out 
Is that there's still some issues? Oh dear. Ah, apparently, yeah, this, this is shown up uh, automatically if you click on accept. The plans monitor pops up again because we have issues under this issues tab. So let me just uh, cancel this. Uh, wait, not cancel. Let's just close this again and uh, click on accept again just to show you what happens. All right, there it is. Click on the issues. Now we've seen, I've seen to have created a wind farm on top of oil and gas installations. So let's have a look, view the issue on the map. And there is a oil and gas installation. Actually, there's multiple ones. I'll just close this to make it a bit easier to see. There's two, at least two oil and gas installations on top, or three, there is another one uh, on top of this wind farm, or the wind farm is on top of them. Now, this is, of course, also part of one part of maritime spatial planning, figuring out how to combine all these different activities. Okay, so we would need to solve that. I won't get into that. What I'll do is I'll just leave this for now and have a look uh, to start wrapping things up, uh, have a look at what people have been doing and also if there are still any questions. Uh, Igor, while I do that, perhaps you could get into what would be a typical uh, way of dealing with these conflicts of human activities during a session or in real life maritime spatial planning. How do we deal with this? Yeah, some, some of the conflicts um, are really conditional, so you have to solve them. Uh, a shipping route, if shipping is not allowed through a wind farm, uh, by international legislation, or you build a wind farm uh, through the international maritime uh, route, you have to find a way to solve that conflict, uh, either by changing your wind farm or by changing the shipping route. Some yeah. other conflicts are just tensional, uh, depends on your policy, so whether you allow it or you want to ignore it. Maybe even in this case, you could imagine that maybe an oil rig is positioned in a wind farm. Um, but you have to find ways to dealing with that. Um, then, of course, you come to the political side of it. Mm -hmm. uh, it might be that in a real situation, stakeholders are simply not happy with the designs. So even if it's technically possible, uh, they raise their voices and they go in the political arena. For instance, if a wind farm means that shipping is not allowed, um, or fishing is not allowed, and it is an important fishing ground, and the fishing men will go to court or use any political means uh, to get this idea or this plan off the table. Uh, or they might be able to ask for compensation, which is a very realistic now. In, yeah. in Europe or as well, also in the Netherlands. Um, in terms of drawing and planning, uh, it would mean in a session that the responsible planners would get together, mm -hmm. uh, have a little meeting and see how the different plans from different sectoral plans or different national plans, where the conflicts are and what is the best way to solve them, either technically or by so sort of like a win-lose situation where one sector wins and the other one just needs to give up and maybe is possibly compensated. Or another solution is actually to create win-win situations. For instance, what if you could combine wind farming with aquaculture or where uh, fishing to some extent is possible in uh, a wind farm? Uh, so these are all very intricate mechanisms of technical solutions combined with political institutional uh, yeah. solutions, which is very, very realistic also in the real game. Yeah, yeah, there you go. Yeah, and of course, then we have the wonderful reality of a simulation game in which you can, in this case, just say, okay, okay, yes, of course, we should discuss and think what's the optimal solution. But if you want to have just a quick uh, a quick technical solution, you can just change the shape. <laughs> uh, change the shape as I did just in a moment ago. Uh, you just click edit and move the points that make the shape to make it uh, exclude, in this case, the oil and gas installations, meaning that the final... 
Ja, 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 of you be hard work is to decommission the oil and gas. Yeah, of like, course. Right? Yeah, you, you could make it part position. of your plan to actually decommission these oil rigs, and then you can keep the wind farm at the same size. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Now I've, I've noticed quite uh, some activity from uh, other players, which is wonderful. Uh, playing with uh, yellow, purple, blue, and green. Uh, I always also noticed that they're running into the fact that this is a live simulation where the clock, uh, the simulated clock, is ticking, which means, yeah, uh, month by month uh, the simulation uh, continues. And uh, if you planned uh, to have your uh, wind farm implemented by, for instance, January 2028, yeah, or a telecom cable, I see as an example. Ah, it's already April 2028, so that plan is then automatically archived, and you'll get a warning, uh, which, uh, you know, is part of, uh, part of the game in this case. Of course, in a, in a real session, you might not want to have so much time pressure for the players. They ah, time is ticking, finish your plan, otherwise it'll be arch archived. Uh, the nice thing about it, about the system, is that you can also control the time. So a moderator of an MSP uh, challenge session can just pause the simulation, give people time to finish their plan if you want to, for whatever uh, purpose. I won't do that now because we're out of almost out of time anyway. So I'd like to uh, continue, uh, well, start uh, start wrapping up by asking one or two more questions to well, to Igor and myself, I guess, <laughs> that came in from the audience. So let's see. Um, ah, Pranav asked, uh, where do you get the bathymetry data from? Now, uh, I'll just quickly show this because this is also nice uh, to wrap up with. Uh, we have uh, um, on the community wiki, we've got lots of information. I'll just bring that this up. So if you go back to the community wiki website, so community.mspchallenge.info, you'll actually see really a lot of uh, uh, pages here that offer lots of explanations about uh, how the software works, what you need, uh, uh, et cetera. Getting the software, of course, is where you got the software from. One page is over here, data sources. You can click on there and there for each edition. So in this case, the North Sea edition you'll find for each layer the source and when we last got it. So there you go. Um, so that's one answer. Uh, Pranav also asked, could you touch upon the biodiversity indicator? How are they derived? Yeah, I'm, I'm not the best person to ask this question to. Igor, do you know? The biodiversity indicator? Yeah, maybe you can show yeah. how the... the, the the show the layer. Yeah, so it's basically, it's in here. Uh, so we have the biodiversity indicators, the Shannon diversity indicator, which is a heat map, which is, uh, yeah, there are some differences here and there, but hard to see. And we have a large fish indicator, uh, which is also a heat map. Uh, it seems to be taking a bit of time to load, but that's okay. Oh, there it is. Another heat map. So if, we, if I were to open this, We'll see uh, the large fish indicator uh, represents uh, the density of uh, large fish. Now, these are kinds of indicators are generated by the EcoPath with EcoSim simulation running in the background. So this is a pretty um, uh, specialist, um, uh, uh, yeah, expert uh, knowledge on how to create uh, a sufficiently valid indicator. Uh, it takes, obviously, it takes into account the actual large fish that are included in the EcoPath with EcoSim model um, and then uh, derives a heat map from this. We do have a publication coming out very soon about the EcoPath with EcoSim model. Uh, so keep an eye on our community wiki website. Uh, we'll publish the paper on there as uh, soon as it's uh, actually published by uh, the journal. Okay, uh, I think we have time for one or two more questions and then we'll have to wrap up and hand it over to uh, uh, well, the next presenter. Uh, let's see. Martijn, again, Martijn Haag, I guess, does the ecological model and other models update in real time in response to any, any plans or changes? So does it update in real time, the model? Igor? The answer is yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. 
Indeed. <laughs> yeah. So the, the pressures of the decisions that you make uh, from different countries, they uh, they go into the yeah, either the shipping model or the ecology model or the energy model. And there is interaction also between the models itself. So redirecting uh, a shipping route will lead to ships creating noise and bottom disturbance and all kinds of other pressures in another location, which goes into the ecology model that calculates the ecological effect of uh, changes in shipping uh, as, as a result, for instance, of planning a wind farm. So planning a wind farm leads to uh, ships taking another route, which creates uh, ecological impacts or consequences on the ecology model and so on and so on. Yeah. So this is what I tried to, to introduce also in my lecture about integrated planning of complexity. And this is taking real time following the time indicators in the bar above, uh, which can also be controlled by the moderator, as Harold explained, by pausing time or, or speeding up time. So if we have a session of uh, maybe 10 stakeholders playing different planners, maybe they spend half a day or a day or even more on making these plans. Once they are done with planning, then, uh, for instance, Harold as a moderator, uh, can say, okay, now we simulate the next uh, the consequences of all your decisions for the next eight years. So the planners don't draw anymore uh, within this time period, but you can see on the performance indicators how the system has responded to the planning decisions that you made during the planning period. Yeah. Yeah, there you go. So, uh, yeah, we have time for one more short question, and then um, I'll wrap up. So Santanu asked a question, how do you incorporate tolerance for irregular events like cyclones, irregular events, things that pop up, uh, that happen, uh, might be emergencies also, uh, cyclones, how do we incorporate that or a certain tolerance for that? Uh, short answer, this, this maybe is close to what in entertainment gaming is like Godzilla modes, Godzilla walks in or have a cyclone extremities, which of course can be quite realistic. Mm -hmm. uh, we do not take them into account. Uh, basically also because this is integrated long-term planning. Yeah. Uh, so short-term disturbances like a cyclone disrupting the energy infrastructure at the North Sea uh, is not taking into account. I think there is other planning tools for that. If there is good reasons why such extremities uh, need to be taken into account and the consequences of it. Of course, the platform allows to develop it, but in the current systems, it is quite a like a stable evolutionary uh, development. One yeah. thing you could consider for further uh, thing, of course, is climate change and sea level rising and that sort of impact. Uh, but that would mean going really into new areas. And we would love to do it and see how we can connect this to climate change models and how planning and climate change uh, interact with each other. Yeah. All right. We've really run out of time. Thank you very much, Igor. I'd like to um, uh, also thank people who uh, yeah, took the time and effort required to uh, install and set up the software, log on to the online demo. So I'll acknowledge them uh, for a moment. So thank you especially to Pranav, uh, Pelagia, Sanda, Carolina, uh, I think also Soran, Andrea. Yeah, wonderful stuff. I do uh, thank you so much for take, uh, taking the time to trying it out. I wish I could show what you drew, but I see you're still struggling to get rid of those issues. Oh, maritime spatial planning is hard, isn't it? And also you're struggling a little bit to get uh, uh, to get the plans implemented or at least uh, done on time for the simulation uh, to run. I do notice uh, a nice wind farm off the coast of Denmark. So a nice wind farm there being developed blue. It looks like the issues have been resolved. So if whoever's playing blue right now were to uh, change the state of the plan to consultation, I could show it, but I won't. I won't wait for that. It's okay. Uh, this this online demo server is uh, continuously available, 24/7. Uh, it keeps running. If it runs out of time, it just restarts. So don't expect your your spatial plans to last. 
uh, they'll be removed as soon as the end of this uh, the simulation is reached, and then it restarts again. But the nice thing then is that you can you can keep trying and uh, learning how this software works and what MSP is all the time, continuously. Uh, it's free. Uh, you've got the software now. Uh, I'm not touching anything. You can just keep keep going and see how the simulations respond and keep running. Having uh, said all of that, it's really high time to hand it over to uh, Marta Bertrand uh, to talk about the Copernicus Marine Environment Monitoring Service. I thank you very much and um, hope to see you soon. Is it live for Marta? Yeah. Is something happening? Uh, I don't know. I think uh, <laughs> either we need to, uh, someone needs to activate the video. Oh. Um, no, Marta can uh, grab the floor. Yes, okay. Yeah. Uh, hello, so um, someone has a video already prepared? Okay, that's perfect. Um, so I'm just uh, basically introducing you to Wikio and how you can use this DS platform to access uh, marine data. And, and then I, I will have some time to answer to all the questions from participants. So we can just now play the video. Welcome to this session about Wikio that is part of the online event of the Copernicus Eyes on Earth Roadshow. My name is Marta Bertrán and I will show you how to use the Wikio Diaz platform to access marine data for maritime spatial planning. First, I will explain what you can do with Wikio. Then I will explain how to register. We will see an example so that you can use Wikio to access Copernicus marine data. I will also introduce you on the possibilities to compute and transport data. Finally, I will explain how you can contact us through the user support. Let's see what you can do with Wikio. ADIAS is a data and information access service. In ADIAS, users can access Copernicus data for free and request processing resources to work with this data on the cloud. There are five DS platforms and the focus in this webinar is on Wikio. Wikio makes Copernicus data available for reanalysis, real-time analysis, and forecast. Data from ocean, atmosphere, land, among others, are available. Some of these data come from satellites such as Sentinel-1. Wikio is a DS that is being developed by three partners. One, EUMETSAT the European Organization for the Exploitation of Meteorological Satellites. 2. ECMWF, the European Center for Medium Range Weather Forecast. And 3. Mercator Ocean, which is a private non-profit company that describes, analyzes and forecasts the state of the ocean. Wikio's offer is threefold. First, it is a single access point to open and free Copernicus data. Second, there are cloud-based processing resources and related tools. The third one is the user support that is based on the expertise from the three institutions that are developing Wikio. With Wikio, you can search, download or compute data and you can also promote your business. The only paying services on the Wikio platform are the processing resources on the cloud. To get started with Wikio, you need to register. Registration at Wikio is free. There are two types of registration, the essential registration for the data access and the advanced registration to access the cloud processing resources.
At the right part on top of the Wikio page, you can click on Register. You will have to fill in a form with the following mandatory data. Email address, username, password. In the Subscription Plan section, you can select between Essential, Free, Let's learn Wikio by means of a use case for the Black Sea. We would like to know what was the surface temperature of the Black Sea in the coast of Romania in June 2018. Let's see how you can search for data. As we have seen previously, data search on Wikio is free. The Wikio Data Viewer displays a map at the background. In order to search a data, click the button Add Layer. On the left, you can type the data of interest in the free text search box. For this example use case, we want to type Black Sea. A total of 24 datasets appear on the results list. You can also use filters for an extended search. We have found the dataset Black Sea, high resolution, L4, sea surface temperature reprocessed. For each dataset, you can find a description, an identifier called dataset ID, and information about the time and space covered. Click the button Add to Map in order to access the data. A list of variables appears. We have clicked the Add to Map button to display the sea surface temperature on the viewer. Now we are going to look at the steps needed to download data. As mentioned before, downloading Copernicus data from Wikio is free. The map in the background of the screen can be used to select the geographical area. Our area of interest is the Romanian coast of the Black Sea. Regarding the temporal parameters, we have selected one month of data, that is June 2018. Click the button Request Data on the Layers tab. Then, go to the Jobs layer and select the button Order. This will allow you to download your files locally in your computer. For this dataset, the downloaded data is in an etcdf file, that is a .nc extension. You might need additional GIS software to visualize it. In the screenshot, there is an example of the sea surface temperature for the selected area. Instead of request data, you can click on Show API request. This will allow you to get the code that can be used in Jupyter Hub or in your virtual machines. The advantage of this functionality is that you do not need to download the data in your local computer. Now it is necessary to know the tools to work with the marine data found. Computation and transformation of data at Wikio can be done on our cloud infrastructure. One option is to process the data on JupyterLab that is offered for free in Wikio Essential Accounts. There is a Python Jupyter notebook with a step-by-step -step example. There are also virtual machines, VMs, available for computing and transforming data, which are part of the paying services. There are several pricing options depending on the configuration you may need for your virtual machines. Configurations are different depending on the RAM, storage and the number of CPUs needed. For some of them, there is also a trial period available at no cost. The Wikio virtual machines can be accessed through a dashboard or by SSH access. In this example, we can see that there are two virtual machines in this dashboard, VM test1 and VM test2. Let's take a closer look now at the Wikio's user support. You can interact with the service desk for free. You can ask about everything related to the platform, 
offers available, data access, virtual machines on the cloud. Once the user support team receives a message from a Wikio user, this request can be forwarded to Wikio's experts working at UMEDSAT, ECMWF, or Mercator Ocean. There are two ways available for you to contact Wikio support. The first is to send a message through the web form, and the other one is by sending an email to support at wikio.eu. We hope we have convinced you to join us. You can find us on the web portal wikio.eu, the Wikio Twitter account, and for any questions, do not hesitate to contact the service desk at super at wikio.eu. Thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you, Marta, for this very nice presentation on Wikio, uh, which illustrated a bit more of uh, well the data service you you provide and your position in the ecosystem of Copernicus. Um, well, during the presentation, uh, questions popped up, and I would like to pick a few uh, in the coming ten to fifteen minutes. So, um. Once again, so could you please inform us how we can collaborate with the Wikio platform? Um, uh, collaborate in terms of uh, which aspect do you mean? Um, well, so collaborating in terms of data usage, on access, on... on... Okay, so um, users can access Copernicus data for free. So the only requirement is to register and then log in, in the in the system. And then also they can they can have different types of virtual machines that they can use uh, to access to our cloud infrastructure. So right now we have uh, like some of the virtual machines available for for free trials, but uh, then we also have some some of them uh, that have a pricing uh, related. But for any kind of user that would like to try out and see what kind of Copernicus data is there available, and just to try out, uh, the service is, is free in, in terms of uh, data access and discovery and doing small um, tests on how to run a script on Jupyter Notebooks. Okay, thank you. And, and, and these users you mentioned, um, is there a differentiation and limitation to the types of users? For example, students, small companies, startups, large corporates? Or is it uh, all parties being equal? No, in fact, we really don't don't make a difference at the moment in the different types of users. If we, you go out to our website, you will see that there are organizations, uh, institutions, researchers, and even students, and also individual users that try out our platform and then they develop their their applications. But also, um, so at, at the end, is um, what matters the difference between one user or another is the processing capabilities needed. So in terms of data access, it is the same for everyone. As I said, it is Copernicus data, so it is free and open for everyone. And then in terms of on the cloud on the cloud infrastructure, it's more a matter of how many CPUs do you need, or how many RAM, how many storage, or how much do you need uh, in order to to process your your application. But then, uh, of course, students can access, uh, researchers can access Wikio, companies, and we have a, a wide range of different users. Okay, okay. And, and, and from a data perspective, um, we now focus, because of the maritime spatial planning, uh, especially on, on the marine data, um, is it also in the, in the uh, repository of Wikio that other data sets for land, for example, are available? Or is that something more which we have to discover with, with the other DIAS partners? Uh, no, no. In fact, in Wikio, uh, so in this, the focus of this session was on maritime data because that was the focus of the session as well. Correct. Uh, of the maritime spatial planning. But of course, uh, there is data from the different Copernicus services. So apart from the CMEM service, there is data coming from the atmosphere service, we also have land data available from the different satellites, uh, Sentinel satellites, and the users can just uh, go and check and see what they need. Of course, if they, they think there should be some data set there that is not available, they can contact the user support and see why is there not this data that they are expecting. But in general, we have a very wide range of, of data sets, and I just encourage everyone to try it out. 
Okay, and is this then your user support or is it the user support from the Copernicus, uh, from Copernicus? Mm, so, in fact, uh, Wikio is, uh, as I explained in the video presentation, is, is composed by a, a team from Mercator Ocean, ECMWF, and UMITSA. And uh, in the user support team is composed by professionals from the three different institutions. Depending on the level of expertise required, depending on the topic, uh, then will be one of the institutions uh, or the other replying to the request from the users. But in the end, this will be, the user will want to know in general who is directly answering the question. But in any case, of course, uh, several experts will be asked about it. Okay, and, and um, um, we also learned from previous sessions that um, students who are participating in this uh, roadshow uh, have an interest in uh, additional training sets, training data. Um, can they go to a website or is there, uh, how do they get the information uh, they want to? Uh, so they can they can go to our website wikio.eu as I explained in the video, and we can we have a section that is um, that is focused on guides and references. So they can they have a lot of, of of guides there that they can follow in order to set up a virtual machine or access the data, and more will be coming up because we are we are now on, on this uh, first version of Wikio, and we are preparing new materials and training sessions. Yeah. So, could you could you give us a maybe a future outlook on on what kind of new material is uh, developed? Or um, I just suggest that um, everyone interested in that it just goes to just go to our next new section of the website or in our Twitter account because there are the updates on the specific dates and online events that are taking place right now, and they can of course take a look and at past events that also were done before and for the upcoming opportunities everything is announced online okay okay are there any uh, representative offices uh, throughout europe Excuse or is me? it more from online community i i didn't get the question can you repeat again please are, are, are there any representative offices for example for mercator or wikio throughout europe throughout the member states or is it uh, only online accessible, the information? Mm, in general, like right now, we are doing all the training events or sessions online uh, due to the current situation with the COVID. But of course, of course. Uh, when, when it was possible and we hope it will be possible, uh, there were, of course, um, on-site sessions and presentations and even demo for participants of, of those events, such as the Eisen Earth World Show that took place last year. Yeah, 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 okay, okay. Um, okay, um, I'm having a quick look on my screen to see if any questions come in. I think we have covered them all. So Marta, uh, do you have anything that you would like to say because you, want to stress it again or uh, emphasize again uh, to the participants in this uh, session? Um, yes, uh, if, if I have the chance, I would encourage everyone to, to try it out. Uh, register is uh, very quickly. Uh, it doesn't require at the moment any kind of uh, bank information because we are right now offering the data for free. And of course, uh, the virtual machines will have this, this pricing later, uh, depending on, on the trial period and the type of machine chosen. But for the data access and the downloading of data and trying to process bits of data is, is open and free. And then it's, it's good that people try it out first. And don't get the idea that it is too difficult or too technical because um, at the end, uh, the viewer I showed in the video is very intuitive, I would say. And I think that in case of questions, as I said, like the user support is very active and very keen on answering specific questions and detailed questions to, to users. So just uh, just to encourage everyone to, to try it out. Okay. Um, well, thank you very much, Marta, for your uh, contribution then to the, to the roadshow and to explain uh, the services of uh, Wikio and of how the DLS is organized. Um, in case there are no further questions, then I would like to close the uh, Q&A session, if that's all right with you, Marta? Yes. 
Okay, then once again, thank you very much. And uh, I would especially like also to thank Harald and Igor uh, for their presentation and simulation session. Um, from the organization perspective, uh, the Dot Space Foundation and the consortium, uh, we are planning in the coming weeks to organize a similar session with MSP and uh, to further illustrate and to uh, inform you on marine spatial planning issues or uh, opportunities. So for the registered, part registered participants, please keep an eye on your email box and uh, the announcement will be made uh, on social media and the social channels. So for now, thank you all for your participation. Uh, we hope to see you around in other sessions and uh, all the best with your own marine spatial planning applications and plans. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.